Pastor Brad will stop me at 10 to 7. So I need to rush through this so that I can get this done. I, I trust that you will be blessed through this. This, this, this session is called, or the, the title of this session is called Recruit People That Can Discern Opportunity. Recruit People That Can Discern Opportunity. Um, I want to refer to a chapter in Acts that reflects a bit of the life of Saul. Saul you're familiar with that became Paul, right? Saul <coughs> Saul, you, you will understand, got the approval from the high priest to plot murderous plans against the disciples and against the Christians. You know the church has started by now, uh, there's been a process where the death of Christ the resurrection, the 40 days of appearance, <coughs> mysterious appearance, and uh, the ascension and the start of the church. Peter, John, and these men went out preaching the gospel. Hundreds and thousands were added to the church. Paul got permission from the synagogues, the high priest, to plot murderous plans against the Christians. These that continued with the gospel. In his pursuit, you know the story, he was struck off his horse. The, the, the interpretation of being struck off your horse is you have been stripped from your authority. I like to say it like the African kind of said, you have been stripped from your authority. <laughs> <laughs> the Bible says he was, he was struck with blindness in other words, he had no vision. God was getting him ready to alter his vision. And, and this interesting portion reads Acts 9 verse 4 to 9. It says, he fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Yeah, Saul asked, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Though he was persecuting the Christians, Jesus says, you are persecuting me. He replied, now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound but did not see anyone. And whenever an amazing thing happens, there was a sound. As Pastor Brad um, so well leads us. Saul got up from the ground but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into the back into Damascus for three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything there's much you can speak about the three days that he was blind the scripture that I really want to read to you is this scripture when he came to Jerusalem this is now God showed him Jesus showed him Saul has to go down into Damascus into the street called straight street there you will find a prophet of God called Ananias Ananias and he must go to this man of God and there the man of God will give him a message. And in the other side, God spoke to Ananias and said to Ananias, Ananias, Saul has been persecuting the church of God. I am dealing with him. I'm changing his life. I'm sending him to you. I've got an assignment on his life. God still works that way. Amen. So when he came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples. This is now after after Ananias prayed for him and after his eyes were opened, Paul, Saul has become Paul. Paul now ready to preach the gospel, to go out and do what the Christians are doing. Establish the church of God. When he came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples. Watch now what happened. But they were all afraid of him. Not believing that he really was a disciple. But Barnabas, Barnabas, that is the other, 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 other side of my name. Joseph, Barnabas, Joseph, son of consolation. That is my name. Barnabas, that's me. Took him. <laughs> took him. And brought him to the apostles. You, you see what's happening here. He told them how Saul on his journey had seen the Lord. And that the Lord had spoken to him. And how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. So Saul stayed with them and moved about freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. 
talked and debated with the Hellenistic Jews, but they tried to kill him. When the believers learned of this, they took him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. <coughs> then the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace and was strengthened living in the fear of the Lord and encouraged by the Holy Spirit. It increased in number. The church increased. Here's the thing, Here's the thing that I want to share with you. The Christians knew something happened to Saul. Um, he started preaching the gospel and he now made this appearance to the disciples to be embraced as a disciple. You also remember that Saul was a, a, a studying to become a Pharisee. He was studying to become um, a man that knows the scripture. Um, and, and Saul had this experience with God, with Jesus. And he then became Paul. So his life turned around. God wanted to use or wants to use him to preach the gospel, to establish the church. And now he has to introduce him to the disciples, which are the people that God is using to establish the church. And the disciples did not want to believe until they see. This man is maybe using a tactic to infiltrate the church. And he wants to then destroy the church from inside. But Barnabas had the right discernment. And if the whole church and leadership, apostles and disciples refused him, Paul, Saul, would have been disarmed and not been able to preach the gospel. But because Barnabas explained to them, he had the discernment that this is truly something that God did. Listen to what I have to say. Many people are able to recognize opportunity after it is already passed. And that is easy. You see an opportunity after it's passed. But seeing opportunities come and seeing opportunities that's coming is a different matter. Yeah. Those are the people that we're looking for. People that can anticipate something is about to happen. Barnabas saw this man went through something. Something is going to happen. Some disciples says, no, he wants to kill us. There was a particular discernment in Barnabas. That is why you have to learn what opportunities look like and how to seize them. The best and the most people take... Sorry, I've, I've just made notes of these things. Most people, most leaders want to take leadership with them. And people that are leaders with them that can discern opportunities. That, can, that has a great sense of discernment. Discernment for where God is taking the church. Discernment for your own personal life. Because people are looking at your life. How are you leading and conducting your life? And they pick up from the way you conduct your life. If you live your life a hopeless failure, it's no need for people to look at your life. It's no need for you to lead because you can't even lead your own life. So the, 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 the most serious requirement for any leader to have leaders with them as people or a people that has a sense of discernment, people that can discern opportunities, people that can discern the things of God. I need to move fast. Good leaders don't <coughs> rely on luck. Good leaders depend on their discernment. Amen. Amen. I can say that again. Good leaders don't rely on luck. Good leaders depend on discernment. Uh, a certain gentleman called Pete Chrysler, Walter Chrysler, he says the following, the reason so many people never get anywhere in life is because when opportunity knocks, they are out in the backyard looking for the four leaf clovers. It's an expression, and some of you might know the expression. The expression is, you only get three leaf clovers. Now, some people, the, the, the superstition is, if you find a four leaf clover, you're in luck. And many people are out looking for the luck, while the opportunity is knocking. 
We should rather look for the opportunity, rather uh, discern within our spirit, is the opportunity coming? Where is the opportunity? Before it comes, instead of waiting on something lucky to happen. The people with those qualities are the ones you're probably going to want to take with you as leaders. People that have discernment. Amen? It is, it is the simplest definition to discern or to define discernment. Discernment is nothing more than the ability to decide between truth and error. Everybody can say amen. amen. It's, the, it's the ability to decide between right and wrong. Discernment is the process of making careful distinction in our thinking about truth. In other words, the ability to think with discernment is synonymous with the ability to think publicly. In order for you to discern effectively, you've got to think publicly. And when you think, the, the, the measurement is publicly. You know, somebody said, you can't judge me. And it's fine, we don't judge people. But if we have the Bible as our sense of standard, and the Bible says what is wrong and what is right, we are able to tell people, but what you're doing is not right. We don't judge people. But we take the standard of the Bible that is discernment. First Thessalonians 5 21 to 22 says, teaches us that it is the responsibility of every Christian to be discerned. And it says, But examine everything carefully. Hold fast to that which is good. Abstain from every form of evil. The Apostle John issues a similar warning when he says, Do not believe every spirit. But test the spirits to see whether they are from God. Because many false prophets have gone out into this world. Three minutes and I'm done. So, so we have the three days of hope. And Zoe Zana comes up with a team to sing. And we're all expecting her to deliver a bomb of a blessing and a powerful session of singing. And guess what? I got into the station and I said, everybody say, what was that all about? I could not discern that this was going to happen. That she was going to be there and the way they present themselves will be exactly the way they present themselves in the world. And when you present yourself in a music capacity in the world, it's not the same that you present yourself in the church. But then I, I almost beat myself up. How could I allow that? But then the Holy Spirit said to me, no. <coughs> This is for the people to improve on their spirit of discernment. So how did you feel about it? Was that okay for you? Was the girl with the bushy at the back and the tight, whatever she had, was that okay for you? That was. <laughs> <laughs> you want to tell me about it? <laughs> I saw you. Then the Holy Spirit said to me, that is to test the church's discernment. Don't feel guilty about it. Don't beat yourself up. <coughs> and often things go wrong. But how do you know things go wrong? It is to test the level of your discernment. So don't think things go wrong and now, um, I'm using an example, but it's a slip of mind. What, what, what is wrong with them? Uh, you know, your, your discernment also has to be accurate. Your discernment has to be based on the word of God. Yeah. Yeah. Discernment is based on truth and not error. Discernment biblically is the best discernment. And I conclude, I've got one minute left. According to the New Testament, discernment is not optional for, it, for the believer. It is a requirement. The key to living an uncompromising life lies in one's ability to exercise discernment in any and every area of our lives. For example, Failing to distinguish between truth and error leaves the Christian subjected to all manner of false teaching. False teaching then leads to an unbiblical mindset which results in unfruitful and disobedient living a certain recipe for compromise. Discernment finally is the ability to think publicly about all areas of life is the indispensable, it, it, it is indispensable to an uncompromising life. It is the incumbent it is incumbent upon the Christian to seize upon the discernment that God has provided for his precious 
truth. Without it, Christians are at risk of being tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine. Often, there's a discernment based on the truth, which is the word, and then there's the discernment based on the spirit. And the truth and the spirit has to mix. Often, you step into a place and you sense this place is not right. I cannot be here. Um, I have to fix this thing up here, or I have to leave. Um, that is the spirit that connects with the spirit that's in that particular place. Or you, you stand and you want to shoot up by the holy bread, or shoot up by the basin of bread, and exercise your discernment in that way. Um, what is healthy for me? <laughs> what does the health say? You know, holy bread is the best. Discernment is, is biblical truth and information that we have. Discernment is also the spirit. When we don't know something, ask ourselves, Holy Spirit, is this the right thing for you to do? Amen. I know there's two, three questions and then we're going to move on. Pastor <coughs> Brad, that's the first question. Can you help us go in as well? Oh yeah, discernment is not optional for the believer. It is required. It's required. It's required. Um, you, you, cannot, you cannot effectively leave if you don't have discernment. People will approach you from matters that they don't, they're not sure about. <coughs> and you have to give them an answer. And based on that answer you give them, they will either go hang themselves or they will be free. Yeah. Pastor, um, I'd like to know, what, what, what's the difference between um, discernment and then not overthinking? Though? Can you do a point where you discern it but not overthinking? Something specific? Yeah. Uh, it's a very very good question. Overthinking might rely more on your experience. Right? Because if you, if you overthink or think over, what do you think over? Um, um, that does it make sense? You probably rely on some experience of a certain nature, um, which is based, so your, 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 your decision that you're going to make is based on an experience. You might have experienced something similar, and now, based on the experience, which is also good, based on the experience, you are now qualified to make a better decision. So, you, yeah, you think about it. You know? I think um, I think I know where you come from. Okay. Most people are the type of person that I tend to like, um, really play things over and analyze and think. And I think um, eventually you must make a decision. You must reach a decision. Once you make a decision, that decision must be accompanied um, by, by the peace of God. So you, you need to you need to discern, but then there's a point where you need to make a decision. And then once you make the decision, you need to assess whether the decision has um, comes with the peace of God or not. I was here. Some people <coughs> say, you know, I have been meeting, inherited, or the gifting of the serving. So my question would be, how true is that? Um, and is that a specific gifting in certain areas, or is that available as a reason? It's a very good question. A long, a long, a big long is there anybody else that would like to answer that question? I is, is, is discernment a gift? That's really the question. You want to answer? I oh, see. Sorry, 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 Brother Archie. Is it a different question? No, no, no. Okay, let's, let's see what Brother Archie is saying. I think um, your walk with Christ and being a Christian, a community Christian, I want to say every Christian that is born again has the gift of discernment of the Spirit <coughs> to discern which is between right and wrong in the world. So you're saying it, it, it is a gift as well? It is a gift. Okay. Um, I 
think uh, what my understanding is that it is a gift for every gift that needs to be developed. But at the same time, Master mentioned something earlier that discernment based on the word of God, you can develop discernment based on the wisdom that comes from the word of God. And so everything starts by the word and ends by the word. And so to increase discernment, because discernment is really distinguishing between, like you said, the truth and non-truth. And the, what is our guide for truth and non-truth? What if we don't experience the peace of God? Well, we must make that decision. What guides us? It's ultimately the word of God. So that's all. I, I would answer it this way. The sons of Ishika, they were gifted men, the Bible says. And the gift was... They knew the seasons and times. So they were gifted yeah. discerners. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I would agree with Brother Archie and what Pastor Brad is saying. That discernment can also become a gift. And, and, and uh, I suppose whatever you learn in life, that you master and you practice it effectively, becomes then your gift as well. Isn't it so? It becomes you create then this thing as your talent. So I could have become a world-renowned soccer player if I wanted to. Uh, I just had to uh, exercise the gift, and the more I exercise it, and the more I dedicate my time and be committed to it. So, same is is discernment. Discernment can become a gift, which really means it. it it's almost. I, I would say, I would say one of my gifts that God has given me is the gift of discernment, and that enables me. And this is my testimony to you. That enables me to make quick decisions. <coughs> I hear this. Let's do this thing. It's almost there's something in your spirit. I hear this thing. I did not hear it before. I don't know if it's truth or if it's error, but in my spirit, it sounds right. I like what I hear. You know? So so you become so gifted. I suppose it's a 50 plus thing. Five minutes for four minutes and done with It's like a lawyer when you stand and there's an 
accuse. Watch the Oscar Pistorius trial. Those guys are sharp descendants, but in the legal department. They know this man is lying. They pull him, ask him questions, and then they <coughs> Okay. So let us let us work on our discernment. Um, that is a prerequisite for us to be able to lead the people of God. Amen. Praise God. Let's just pray about this. Heavenly Father, we thank you.